All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started, everyone. It's just after nine. Um, so thanks all for coming to my grand rounds today. Um, I think I know most people here in the auditorium, but um, if there's anyone at home who doesn't know me, um, my name's Alex Hamlin. I'm a fourth year eMERGE resident here in Ottawa. Um, and today I'll be talking to you about uh, emergency department deliveries. Uh, big thanks to Dr. Jen Lepard, who was a wonderful supervisor for this Grand Rounds, and thanks as well to Dr. Dante Pascali, who is um, a very lovely OBGYN here at TOH, who also provided a lot of um, comments and feedback for me. So to start you off, I just want you to think of a case scenario. So imagine yourselves working um, a day shift in a smaller community hospital, and you get a patch call that you have a 30-year-old female who is G1P0 at 39 weeks gestational age, um, and she's coming in in active labor. The paramedics are concerned that she's imminently going to deliver, so they're actually going to bring her straight into the emergency department for a delivery. And their ETA is about five minutes away. So I want you to think of your initial reactions to this patch call. Um, what do you want to do to prepare yourselves for this potential delivery in your eMERGE? Um, what equipment do you want to gather? And what are some anticipated complications uh, that you want to be ready for? So the ambulance arrives, uh, but you're called out to the ambulance bay as mom is actively crowning and they don't feel that it's safe to transfer her into the hospital. So before you run out to the ambulance, can you just kind of shout out in the audience things that you want to grab with you just to perform this delivery in the ambulance? What are some things you want to grab? Gloves, yes. Messy? Light, yeah, great point. Yes, love it. Towels. Anything else? Pretty well it. Did you say baby? <laughs> okay, so those are kind of the main things. Um, so yeah, so gloves, warm blanket for a baby, sterile towels, um, two sets of clamps and scissors too to cut the cord afterwards, but that's pretty well like the major things and a, and a headlamp or some sort of light source too is going to be helpful. So you go to the ambulance um, and you successfully deliver this baby, mom and baby are doing well, and then they go up to L&D. Um, and that was a true story. That baby was me, and that uh, hospital was the old North Bay General that's no longer there. So well done. <laughs> All right. Uh, so my objectives for you today are as follows. So I want to look um, and go through the steps in performing a precipitous delivery in the eMERGE, um, hopefully to make them a little bit less stressful and more successful for you. Um, next, I want to go through three of the most kind of feared birthing complications, um, steps in managing, in managing shoulder dystocia, um, nuchal cord emergencies, um, and postpartum hemorrhage. And then finally, I want to review some of the indications and evidence in performing a resuscitative hysterotomy. So um, let's jump right into it. Let's talk about precipitous delivery, deliveries in the eMERGE. So you're probably wondering why we even need to go over this topic today. Um, delivering babies in the eMERGE is such a rare event. Um, and to that point, you're, you're probably right. If you look at the TOH data over the last 10 years, there's probably an average of like two to three deliveries between the civic and the uh, um, general campuses. But I would argue that for those deliveries that do come into the eMERGE, the stakes are actually much higher. Um, there's a general lack of uh, data out there on the mat <laughs> You're laughing at <laughs> the baby. <laughs> There's a general lack of maternal um, and fetal outcomes in the pre-hospital and eMERGE settings. Um, but what we do know is that these environments are associated with higher rates of maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. So there was one retrospective study that looked at all the outcomes uh, for mom and baby over the course of eight years. And what they found was that the rates of shoulder dystocia was about 3%, which is like two to three times higher um, than average. Uh, the rates of postpartum hemorrhage were higher at 6%. Uh, nuchal cords were present in about 9%, prolapsed cords in 1%. And I think what astonished me the most that, is that the rate of neonatal resuscitation was about 25%. So about one in four babies born in the eMERGE are going to need some sort of resuscitative intervention. And that was associated with a 9% infant mortality rate, which is kind of scary. So overall, um, deliveries in the eMERGE are rare, but when they do happen, we know that they're associated 
uh, with more complication. So we need to know how to do this and we need to know how to do it well. So let's start with your initial evaluation when an imminent delivery arrives to your emergency department. Um, I think for many of us, our first reactions may be, well, how fast can this patient be brought up to the birthing unit? Um, but in reality, that's not always the case. So you may be working at a center where you don't have OB capabilities, um, or the baby may be like actively crowning and it's unsafe to transfer her. Um, the most dangerous place to deliver a baby is in transport, so you really need to weigh um, the risks and benefits of transferring. Um, so first thing you want to do is you want to try and get an estimated due date, so either by report from mom or from the last menstrual period. Um, and if you have neither of those, you can kind of get a rough estimate if you do um, estimate the fundal height. Um, so generally the uterine fundus will be at the level of the umbilicus at about 20 weeks. Um, and then it increases about a centimeter for every week thereafter up until about 36 weeks when it then drops into the pelvis. Um, you want to know if this is a single versus multip, uh, any pregnancy complications so far, um, and then just general history questions for OB. Um, how frequent are the contractions? Has there been any gush of fluid, bleeding, fetal movements, etc.? And then to determine if this delivery is imminent, you need to do a sterile vaginal exam to determine the degree of effacement and dilation. Um, a fully dilated cervix is 10 centimeters, um, and a fully effaced cervix, a cervix feels about like it's paper thin. Um, but honestly, if you're doing an exam and you're trying to feel and you're like, well, how dilated is the cervix? What's the effacement? Um, if there's any doubt, they probably have enough time to go up to l &D. It's going to be pretty obvious when a baby's on the way. Um, and then you're also feeling for presenting parts. So are you feeling a head? Are you feeling a foot? Are you feeling a cord? Um, try to get a sense of um, what the presenting part is. So if babies seemed imminent, you need to prepare for two patients. Um, so you want to have all the equipment that you want uh, for both a complicated delivery and a potential neonatal resuscitation. So for baby, you're going to want your neonatal warmer, some suction, uh, cardiorespiratory monitors, blankets, and then appropriate uh, pediatric sized airway equipment, both ET tubes and intubation blade. And then for mom, uh, you want your sterile uh, gloves, gown, towels, again, two clamps and he or hemostats and some scissors. Um, you may want some suture materials at the bedside and then some uterotonic agents like oxytocin uh, should significant bleeding occur. So in terms of performing the delivery, so you want to have your patient in your recess area, um, in dorsal lithotomy, preferably in a gynae bed. Um, don't hesitate to call a code 333 if you want OB immediately available at the bedside. Um, and then in terms of, you know, just reviewing the maneuvers of delivery, so you're using your dominant hand to just support the perineum um, with a sterile towel. Um, just a bit of gentle pressure so that it doesn't tear when um, the head is delivered. And then you're using your non-dominant hand to place a little bit of pressure on baby's head. Again, just to control the descent of the head. Um, you're applying a little bit of flexion to baby's head as well, just to create a smaller diameter. So once the head delivers, the head is going to rest at you. So it's going to slowly turn and it's going to turn towards maternal thigh. Um, at this point, you're checking for a nuchal cord. So you're just running your finger around the neck to see if there's a cord. Um, and then you're going to deliver the anterior shoulder. So you're putting your palms against baby's cheeks and you're applying just gentle, gentle down, downward traction, traction to deliver that anterior shoulder. Um, as for ACOG recommendations, oxytocin 10 units IM should ideally be given after the anterior shoulder. Um, but in reality, in speaking with Dr. Pascali, um, this isn't often the case. If you do it right after delivery, that's fine too. So the next step is you're going to deliver the posterior shoulder. So with your hands in the same positions, um, you're then going to apply um, upward traction to deliver that posterior shoulder. Uh, the rest of the body usually delivers um, uh, spontaneously without any help. You're going to support the head and the neck with one hand, um, the feet with the other, and for the love of God, don't drop that baby. And then uh, lastly, you're going to cut the cord. Um, so you're cutting it at about 30 to 60 seconds, probably closer to 60 seconds. Um, you're placing two clamps um, about three to four centimeters away from each other and cutting in between. Uh, normally for like a healthy, vigorous baby, you can cut it at about like five centimeters from the fetus. Um, but our pro tip from our OB colleagues is that if baby is flat or you're anticipating some sort of resuscitation, um, you can cut it a little bit longer at like 10 centimeters um, just to allow them uh, some room to do an umbilical vein catheterization uh, if you need to. 
And then the last step is delivery of the placenta. So this usually happens within five minutes of a delivery, um, but it can happen up to uh, 10 to 15 minutes afterwards. Um, and signs that the placenta has separated from the uterus is if you see like a big gush of blood, um, the uterus is starting to firm up, um, or spontaneous uh, umbilical cord lengthening. If you don't have delivery of the placenta within five minutes, um, you can ask mom to bear down. That increased intra-abdominal pressure um, often works to help deliver that placenta. Um, but if that doesn't work, um, then you can take steps too. So you can apply just gentle traction to the placenta once you're sure it's separated and apply suprapubic pressure as shown in the photo uh, just to prevent uterine inversion. As a quick reminder, you're certainly not applying bundle pressure at this point because um, that can precipitate a uterine inversion. So after the placenta is delivered, then you can try to promote uterus contraction by doing a fundal massage and administering oxytocin if you haven't yet. And then finally, you're just examining the placenta to look, make sure it looks all intact and no pieces are missing. All right, uh, the next couple slides just kind of show you where the equipment is at uh, both the civic and general campuses. Um, so here is the civic, um, just uh, to the right of room five, you'll see your baby warmer in the back. Um, down below, you also have um, like a portable orange um, delivery kit um, that you can take with you if you need to leave the department. And then at the very back on the top of the shelves there, you have your emergency section um, equipment as well. Um, at the general hospital, right when you walk into recess, um, you have your baby warmer way at the back behind like your level one transfusers and the rest of your recess equipment. Um, and then just above the sink, before you walk into the ante room to room four, you also have um, your C-section tray and delivery trays where your TTE equipment are. All right. Um, the last thing I just wanted to talk about too is just to review some of the things we learned from uh, the code 333 that our SIM team ran in March of this year, um, just for some practical tips that you can use if you ever find yourself in this situation. So the first thing is um, you wanna make sure that mom's bed is turned 180 degrees. There's gonna be um, a huge amount of people watching, a big audience, just protect her privacy and just turn that bed around. The other thing is that the baby warmer needs its own head wall, so it doesn't work if you just kind of plug it in beside mom's bed. Um, so it needs its own head wall for the oxygen and suction to work. Um, ideally, its own room, just to prevent some of the chaos from all the people that are gonna be around. Um, and then lastly, it's also helpful to assign um, an ED gatekeeper, so either like an eMERGE physician or an RN who's been there from like time zero. Um, if you can imagine, there's gonna be like four teams there. There's gonna be like ED, anesthesia, peds, and OB. If you have like three to five people per team, that's a huge amount of people in one room. Um, so if you have just one person outside of the room just to help direct the incoming teams and provide a succinct handover, that just helps you from your communication point of view. And then as a quick reminder, your code 222 is your neonatal emergencies. Uh, I remember this, it's a smaller number, so it's a smaller patient. Uh, so 222 is going to get your PEDS, PEDS RT, RN, and anesthesia. And then your 333, you're getting everybody from a code 222 plus uh, your OB colleagues and adult anesthesia and adult RT. All right, before we move on to our next section, I'm just going to show you some baby photos of some of our residents <laughs> and see if you can guess who it is. Who's this little munchkin? Is that? That is Hashem's. That is Dr. Karimi, indeed. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, uh, let's move on to shoulder dystocia. So shoulder dystocia refers to the bony impaction of the fetal anterior shoulder against the pelvic outlet after the delivery of the head. Um, it occurs in about 1% of vaginal deliveries, again, a bit higher in the eMERGE setting. Um, but despite the fact that it infrequently occurs, um, it requires like rapid and definitive action because if you're not familiar with this and not familiar how to manage it, there's a lot of um, complications for both mom and baby. Um, there's a lot of risk factors out there that have been associated with shoulder dystocia, um, things like you know maternal diabetes, macrosomia, post dates, et cetera. Um, but in reality, a lot of the cases aren't associated with shoulder dystocia, uh, so it's really hard to predict which ones uh, are gonna arise. One of the signs you can look for is something called a turtle sign. Um, so this is when the anterior head delivers, but then it retracts tightly against the perineum. Uh, you might see some facial flushing in baby as well. 
Um, but the most reliable finding is that gentle downward traction of that head doesn't deliver the anterior shoulder and it's kind of stuck. Uh, with regards to complications, um, for a mom, the most um, uh, significant will be like a big postpartum hemorrhage or uterine inversion, um, third and fourth degree lacerations. And then for a baby, there's a risk of brachial plexus injuries, uh, clavicle and humerus fractures, and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. As for our OB colleagues, you generally have about seven minutes in an uncompromised baby to complete the delivery. So um, I know that might not seem like a lot of time, but you actually have a little bit more time than you think. So because the management of shoulder dystocia is quite time sensitive, um, it requires fast and definitive action. Um, an easy and rational approach is, is needed. Um, there's been a lot of maneuvers that kind of intend to facilitate um, the delivery um, of shoulder dystocia, but there haven't been any large like randomized control trials that show that one maneuver is better than the other. So this is my proposed algorithm. It kind of goes from the least to the most invasive. Um, and if a new maneuver isn't working after about you know, 30 to 60 seconds or so, um, then I would move on to the next maneuver. So the first step in my algorithm is to actually recognize shoulder dystocia, announce it, label it, and then get help if you need more. Um, you need to have mom focused on you and your instructions. So you just need to like take control. Um, you need to tell her to stop pushing, most importantly, because the more she pushes, the more impacted that shoulder is going to get. Um, so you need to have everybody available, uh, at least a second physician capable of performing like a neonatal recess. Um, so the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends that the McRoberts maneuver is your first uh, maneuver of choice. Um, and the reason is it's very non-invasive, it's easy to perform, and it actually works pretty well, especially when you combine it with suprapubic pressure. Um, so in this position, you're having mom's uh, hips um, hyper-flexed uh, against her abdomen and slightly abducted and externally rotated. Um, this is best accomplished if you actually have two assistants on either side just to help hold the legs up. And what this does is it is essentially helps rotate that pubic bone kind of caudally up and over the baby's um, anterior shoulder uh, to disimpact that anterior shoulder. Um, at the same time, you're applying super pubic pressure. Again, not bundle pressure, but just over that pubic bone. And you're kind of applying it like towards, um, like towards baby, um, on an oblique angle uh, to try and, if you're thinking about it, you're trying to like get that shoulder um, uh, a, a deducted. So you're just trying to decrease that visochromial diameter. So you're pushing kind of down towards the feet um, and towards baby's face. So when performed alone, the McRoberts maneuver is successful in about 40% of cases in relieving shoulder dystocia, but when combined with super pubic pressure, it relieves about 60% of cases. Um, additional maneuvers to consider include your internal um, rotational maneuvers. Um, and this requires that the physician's hands actually like manually enter the vagina and do these rotational maneuvers. Um, that's a little bit challenging, especially if you, big, if you, especially if you have big hands. Um, so an episiotomy may be necessary at this step just to facilitate these maneuvers. So this first maneuver here is your, uh, your Reuben maneuver. And essentially you're placing your hands just on the posterior shoulder of that um, upward shoulder. And you're just rotating about 30 degrees. Um, if you think about it, you're kind of doing the same maneuvers as you're trying to accomplish with that super pubic pressure, just internally. The next maneuver is your Woods uh, corkscrew maneuver. So if the Reuben doesn't work, then you can actually try rotating baby like 180 degrees using the same maneuvers and placing your other hand on the posterior shoulder. Um, what this essentially allows is it allows that posterior shoulder to become the anterior shoulder, which is theoretically more advanced down that pelvic outlet. If the shoulders aren't budging, you can try to flip your hands around and kind of do the reverse. Um, this is called the reverse corkscrew, um, but this is kind of the stepwise approach that I would use for my rotational maneuvers. Um, if this doesn't work, my next step in my algorithm, algorithm is to deliver the posterior arm. Um, this is actually one of the most... <laughs> Don't crush baby's head. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is actually one of the most su 
successful maneuvers actually like in the literature it's like 85 percent successful um but the reason i've included it a little bit lower down in my algorithm is the fact that it's like very challenging to perform um uh, so essentially in this one you're um you're inserting your hand along uh, the posterior arm and you're trying to like find that anti-cubital fossa and apply pressure there and this just kind of like flexes the arm up so that you can grasp the forearm or the wrist and just pull and sweep it across that chest and deliver it um there's a lot of uh, change in the ob literature in that they suggest doing this before the rotational maneuvers but i think that for us emerge docs again this is very difficult to do not to mention these women have like no um anesthesia on board um, so that's why I've included it a bit lower down. All right. Um, if this fails, the next step is to um, ask the woman to kind of roll onto the all fours position on the hands and knees. Um, what this does is essentially this repositioning increases your pelvic outlet by about two centimeters. So uh, this is initially like very disorienting, but that combination of an increase in diameter and gravity um, helps deliver that posterior shoulder and is about 80% effective in, in one study in relieving shoulder dystocia. All right. I've included at the bottom of my algorithm some last ditch maneuvers. Hopefully you're kind of never in this scenario. These are truly last resort because there's a lot of morbidity associated with them. Uh, the first one being to perform a clavicle fracture. So you're applying anterior and superior pressure on the baby's clavicle, trying to direct away from the lung, again, to decrease that bisochromial distance. Um, if you have emergent C-sections available, the Zabinelli maneuver um, is also an option. And that's essentially cephalic replacement. So you're kind of reversing those cardinal movements of labor um, and just replacing the head back into the vagina in that occiput anterior position. And then lastly, some physiotomy um, probably has no place in the eMERGE unless you absolutely have no other options. You're doing a sharp dissection of the pubic symphysis midline. A quick note about episiotomies. Um, so if you think about it, an episiotomy is like an elective incision um, of the soft tissue to widen the perineal area. But the problem is that shoulder dystocia is like a bony obstruction. So it's really not going to help all that much. So a routine episiotomy is probably not recommended. The only instance where I would do one, again, is if I'm doing those like internal rotational maneuvers or that delivery of the posterior arm, just to like make more space for my hands to do the procedure. Um, there's two main types of episiotomies. There's midline and unilateral. There's still a little bit of controversy about which one we do. The midline is associated with more risk of extension into the, the rectal sphincter. Um, the medial lateral, a bit more postpartum discomfort, dyspareunia, and bleeding. Um, but overall, ACOG and Dr. Pascali recommend the medial lateral episiotomy. But a pro tip that they just wanted to share with us is that um, a lot of the diagrams kind of show this little 45 degree off angle incision. But if you think about it, um, once everything is kind of so stretched during the delivery, if you make an incision in this area, once things kind of shrink down and restitute, um, it'll kind of be more of a midline incision. Um, and you may risk injuring the sphincter. So what they recommend is actually more of an eight o'clock position. So that by the time things kind of shrink down and restitute, it'll be more of a true medial lateral uh, incision. On that happy note, uh, who's this kiddo? <laughs> Tony? Any guesses? That's not as easy. Yes, well done. This is Dr. Newton. Oh, <laughs> well done. <laughs> yes, two for two, well done. Cool, there's two more, so we'll see. All right, so let's move on uh, to cord emergency. So basically there's two main types of cord emergencies that you may encounter. Um, nuchal cord, where the cord is kind of wrapped around the neck as baby emerges, and then cord prolapse. Um, the first one, nuchal cord, is actually quite common. About like one in three deliveries will have um, a nuchal cord around the neck. Um, they're perceived as really high risk, stressful situations, but in reality, the cords are actually quite loose and don't cause much of an issue. Um, so in those instances um, where the cord is loose, you can just simply reduce it over baby's head. Um, alternatively, you can deliver the baby through the cord and then just disentangle the cord after the delivery, and that usually works fine. In those rare circumstances where the cord is actually really tight and impeding delivery, um, as a last resort option, you can just uh, clamp and cut the cord then and then deliver baby. 
Um, the risks with this, though, um, you may get like fetal anemia, shock, hypovolemia, um, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and cerebral palsy. Um, so this is really last resort if that cord is truly too tight to reduce. Uh, cord prolapse, on the other hand, is less common, about 0.5% of deliveries, but it's much higher stakes. It's about 10% perinatal mortality rates. Um, and you're basically going to diagnose this usually at the time of membrane rupture. So you may palpate um, a cord when you're doing your exam, or you may visualize a cord coming through the introitus. And your management is going to largely depend on whether you have like an emergent C-section available. So obviously here at TOH, where OB is available, um, I just want to emphasize that you are like not touching that cord. You're not trying to reduce it back. Um, you're asking mom to stop pushing, put her in a knee to chest Trendelenburg position just to lift that presenting part off the cord. And you can use your hand as well just to keep that head or that presenting part off of the cord just until they get up to um, the delivery room or the operating room. If you're in a center that does not have immediate C-section available, then in that instance, you would have to do a fundic reduction of the cord. So you're just gently trying to replace that cord behind the baby and then delivering quickly, trying to minimize the amount of cord trauma because that can cause some vasospasm and lots of issues. Okay, who's this, Jeff? Yes, that is Dr. Jared, that's right. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on to postpartum hemorrhage. Um, so postpartum hemorrhage is defined as a loss of 500 cc's of blood uh, after vaginal delivery. Um, it's a pretty controversial definition, though. Um, we notoriously underestimate the amount of blood loss during a vaginal delivery. Um, it happens in about 3 to 5% of cases. It's the leading cause of maternal um, uh, mortality worldwide, about 25% of OB deaths. Um, but it's not hard to, to understand why. At, at late pregnancy, the blood flow, blood flow um, through our uterine arteries is about 500 to 700 cc's of blood per minute. So that's a huge amount. It's like 15% of your cardiac output. Um, so if you have bleeding here, it can cause a lot of problems. Um, so it's important to pay special attention to. Sometimes it's like a large amount and it's very obvious. Um, but if it's subtle and constant, it can go unnoticed and cause um, life-threatening problems. So a big part of managing postpartum hemorrhage is trying to prevent it in the first place. Um, so again, to, pr to promote uterine contraction, you want to give oxytocin either after delivery of the anterior shoulder or soon after the delivery. Um, and then actively managing that third stage of labor um, with the maneuvers that we talked about. So um, delivering that placenta if it hasn't delivered after about five minutes um, and then doing a uterine massage just to promote contraction. Um, the next step is once you've identified postpartum hemorrhage, um, then you do all the normal things that you would normally do in your resuscitation of any um, hemorrhagic shock patient. And that includes getting good IV access, initiating mashup transfusion protocol, um, and then considering TXA. Um, but lastly, it's also important to identify and treat the cause. Um, source control is exactly where the management of postpartum hemorrhage has like some special considerations. Um, and this takes us back to like our four T's from med school. So you want to think of like your tone, tissue, trauma, and thrombin. There's still ongoing bleeding. Um, you can consider tamponade. Um, so you can try using a Foley to try and tamponade that uterus. Um, but the problem is that the uterine cavity is so much larger than like the volume of a Foley that it's probably not going to work. You can try like a couple of Foley's, uh, but again, this might be like not the most effective method. Um, Bakery balloons are specifically designed for this purpose, um, but we don't have them in our emergency department. You'd be hard pressed to find them. I think they do have them up on OB, um, but they're not just like readily available. Um, other management options are going to be made by OB, so things like uterine artery embolization, um, if the patient's stable. Um, before they move on to like hysterectomy, which is like a rare last line, they may try to do like some hemostatic sutures, like a B Lynch suture or like um, uterine artery ligation uh, before they try that. Um, so let's just kind of go over our main kind of management principles when we think about our four T's. Um, so uterine atony is by far the vast majority of uh, causes of postpartum hemorrhage, up to 80% of cases. Um, and you're diagnosing this in, in the setting of like a soft, boggy uterus in the presence of like excessive bleeding after delivery. Um, so once you've identified it, uh, you need to start uterotonic agents. 
in combination with uterine um, uh, by manual massage. Uh, so essentially you're placing one hand uh, internally made into like a fist um, to compress the uterus and then you're externally um, putting counter pressure on the other end um, just to provide that uh, uterine massage to try and make it contract. Um, in terms of uterotonic agents, um, oxytocin is, is probably more of a first line. Um, you can run it at 10 units, um, or sorry, you can use 10 units uh, IM if you don't have IV access, or you can start it as an infusion. Um, other second line agents that you can use as well is your methyl ergonavine, 0.2 milligrams IM. Um, I would use caution with methyl ergonavine in your preeclamptic patients and your hypertensive patients, because uh, this can have effect in increasing your blood pressure. Um, other second line agents include like our prostaglandin analogs, so our carboprost, um, IM doses every 15 minutes, up to eight doses. Again, I would be cautious in our um, asthmatics and our hypertensive patients, because uh, again, this can cause bronchoconstriction as well as vasoconstriction. Uh, misoprostol I've also added as well. It can be given PO or sublingual or PR. Um, but the problem with this is that um, it's not very fast to work. Um, it's slower onset than the other ones. Um, so I've included it, but it probably wouldn't be my first line. Um, so when I was on the OB unit, um, Dr. Pascali showed me that they actually have like PPH kits that you can like ask for. Because some of these meds may not be like readily available. So their PPH kits are kept in the fridge and that includes methyl ergonavine and carboprost. Um, mesoprostol is quick to use, it's room temp. Um, and then oxytocin is probably the most readily available at room temp as well. Um, so our second T is our tissue. Um, so you want to inspect the placenta, see if there's any pieces missing uh, that may give you some clues that there may be some retained um, placental tissue in the um, uterus. Um, so you always want to examine the uterus as well, see if there's any clots, tissue, pieces of placenta that you can kind of um, bluntly dissect with your finger to try and remove. Um, if it's very adherent to the, um, to the uterus, it may be placenta accreta, and they need to go to the OR for that. Uh, trauma can be easily overlooked. So again, you're always examining for any like, hematomas, lacerations, uh, uterine inversion, um, and then repair as needed. Um, so especially if it's like a lower genital tract lesion that's like actively bleeding, um, you can throw in a suture to try and um, get source control in that sense. But if it's kind of higher up, it's probably best left to our OB colleagues uh, to repair. And then lastly, um, we want to think about thrombin. Um, so, you know, especially if our patient has like preeclampsia, you may want to worry about like help or, or DIC. Um, so verify the history and then you can empirically replace clotting factors as needed while you send off your coags. Um, so I also wanted to talk a little bit about TXA. Um, so if you had like a bleeding patient in front of you after the delivery, um, just raise your hand if you would administer TXA in that patient. Okay, maybe like half. Who would not give TXA? Okay, a couple. All right, so kind of like 50-50. So I specifically want to look at um, the woman trial. This was a large RCT that was published in The Lancet in 2017, um, mainly because there's like a lot of misconceptions about this trial initially when it came out. Um, there's a lot of like publicity and news headings that it was like this miracle, life-saving drug. Um, but, in, but the reality is that the paper was actually an, a negative um, trial. Um, but I can't blame the papers for getting this wrong because there was like one single secondary outcome that was positive and the authors led with this in like their abstract in their discussion. So it's a little bit misleading. We'll go over it a little bit just to refresh our memory. So again, this is a large RCT of over 20,000 women with postpartum hemorrhage and they were randomized to get either TXA or placebo. Um, so they got one dose up front and then if they still had bleeding after like 30 minutes, um, they could get a second dose of TXA or placebo. Um, so their primary outcome was all-cause mortality or requirement of a hysterectomy after 48 days after randomization. And so this happened in 5.3% in the TXA group and 5.5% in the placebo group. Um, but the p-value was 0.65, so that was a very large, well-done trial that was clearly negative. Um, what all the crazy headlines kind of hinge on is this one secondary outcome, death due to bleeding. This happened in 1.5% in the um, TXA group and 1.9% in the placebo group. 
um, for a p-value of 0.045. Um, and I'm sorry, it's not coming up well on the screen, but um, if you look at the risk ratio of 0 0.8, if you look at the confidence intervals, it touches one, which is kind of consistent with non-significant. And if you actually calculate out the fragility index for this study, the fragility index was zero, which essentially means that if zero outcomes were different, then it would have been statistically non-significant. So hard to draw like some firm con conclusions from this, um, just given that it was like a secondary outcome with kind of borderline stats. Um, the fact that this effect was probably due to chance alone is probably what I'm thinking, um, but hard to say for sure. I think that overall, like if you were to do like a pure interpretation of the literature, um, you probably shouldn't use TXA, but it's a relatively safe medication. There was no reported difference in adverse effects from TXA. Um, so I'd probably still give it in like my sickest postpartum hemorrhage patients. Um, our OB colleagues tend to always give it. Um, so it may not work. It wouldn't be my first line option, but I would probably still administer it in my sick, sick bleeding patients. All right, this is the last one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is our one of our chiefs, Dr. Ferguson. <laughs> All right, cute. All right, so the last topic that I want to talk about today um, is about resuscitative hysterotomies. Um, so fortunately, cardiopulmonary arrest is a very rare event during pregnancy. Its incidence is about 12,500, um, or one in every 12,500. Um, the most common factors being hemorrhage for about 50% of cases, um, as well as, you know, like amniotic fluid embolism, sepsis, heart failure, trauma, uh, or other kind of common causes. Um, it's widely accepted in our OB and our trauma literature and guidelines um, that a resuscitative hysterotomy should be performed in any woman who suffers a cardiac arrest um, who is over 24 weeks gestation, so just above that umbilicus, um, and initiated within four minutes if ROSC isn't achieved. And I just want to stress today that this is a resuscitative hysterotomy, so it has benefits for mom and fetus. So if you think about it, like under the most optimal CPR conditions normally, we may get like a third of what's our normal cardiac output. Um, if, you, if you add that to like a term pregnant woman, um, the compression of her IVC and aorta um, further decreases that cardiac output by about two thirds. Um, so under like the most optimal CPR conditions in a pregnant patient, that's probably like 10% of our cardiac output. So if you think about it, if you decompress that uterus and you perform this procedure and you remove baby, that improves maternal cardiac output by like 25 to 30 percent, and it really improves her circulatory status. Um, this obviously might have effects on baby as well. So the more um, placental insufficiency there is, by more um, you know decreasing cardiac output, um, their survival time for infants as well decreases the longer the resuscitation is and the longer the arrest takes place. Where does this four minutes come from? There's no real data regarding like the most optimal timelines in performing this procedure. Um, but what we do know is that um, neonatal survivor drastically decreases after about five minutes, which is where this kind of four minutes became our standard. So Dr. Katz is an OBGYN who did this initial research, primarily of retrospective case reports. Um, for obvious reasons, we're never gonna have like an RCT for this problem. And he first uh, published his landmark study um, uh, on all the case reports he could find uh, from 1975 to 1985. And what he found was that of 296 infants in these cases, 40% um, of them survived, which is like a huge number if you think about it. So if this procedure wasn't performed, 118 um, infants would have died. Um, important to note as well that in those that had reported timelines, 70% um, of those survivors um, had the procedure performed within five minutes. So this led to the widespread adoption of this four to five rule, whereby if you don't have ROSC after four minutes, you're starting the procedure at four minutes and then you're done uh, and it's completed by five minutes. Uh, Dr. Katz then went back and did another review of all cases he could find from 1986 to 2004. Um, and again, what he found that there was a 76% um, infant survival rate, which is kind of 
validated his initial premise, but what he also found was that about a third of women uh, had survived as well, which is actually quite huge for like recess literature in general. Um, and in a lot of the cases as well, there was a reported kind of dramatic increase in hemodynamics, um, both in like return of pulse, increase in blood pressure uh, once the uterus was emptied. Let's just take a quick look at some of the newer literature that's out there. This was a study that was published in Resuscitation in 2012. Um, and what the authors of this paper aimed to do um, is they wanted to look at maternal and fetal outcomes after resuscitative hysterotomy um, to see whether like our widely advocated four minute uh, time frame is justified. So they did a 30, 30 year review of all the cases of um, resuscitative hysterotomies, looking at 94 cases overall. Uh, and they looked at maternal and fetal outcomes in terms of survival and the cerebral performance category, which is kind of like their neurologic outcome. One to two was like good to moderate, three to four was um, uh, poor to severe. Um, and then what they found was that for maternal outcomes, there was about a 60% rate of ROSC, 55% uh, uh, survived to discharge, um, and 80% had a good to moderate um, neurologic outcome. Uh, maternal outcomes were better associated with um, in-hospital arrest and if the procedure was done within 10 minutes. Uh, for neonatal outcomes, it was interesting in that a lot of the procedures um, didn't hit that four minute time frame. Uh, the mean time to performing this procedure in those that survived was 14 minutes and then 22 minutes in non-survivors. And again, better outcomes uh, were associated for those that were done in hospital. So things that I take away from this paper is that you know, maternal outcomes may not be as poor as those in other cardiac arrest populations. It's hard to say exactly why, but I kind of speculate that this is in general, like a younger, healthier population at baseline. Um, there's unique precipitating factors to arrest, unique physiologic parameters, um, and there's a high incidence of in-hospital kind of witness arrest in these cases. The second thing is that this four minute time frame usually remains unmet. I think it was like 90% of cases didn't hit that four minute mark. Um, but neonatal survival was still likely if the delivery occurred within 10 minutes, sometimes even up to 15 minutes. Um, and I really wanna stress here, like a lot of authors in papers that look at this um, really stress the difficulty of kind of changing your mindset and like initiating like a resuscitation and, a, and an arrest and then switching your mindset to like performing this procedure which seems like very invasive. It seems like really aggressive and it seems like we're giving up on mom to like salvage baby. But again, what I really wanna to emphasize today is that this is a resuscitative effort to save mom plus or minus baby. Um, I think it's important that we change our language from like a perimortem cesarean section, which kind of in itself implies eventual um, mortality of mom, that we're giving up on mom. And again, kind of switch to more of a like resuscitative hysterotomy, whereby this procedure has really been shown to improve maternal hemodynamics and improve maternal survival. Um, so just to make, break down that mental barrier may make transitioning to performing this procedure a little bit easier. So it may be wise to continue to advocate for this like four minute rule, but in reality, it's actually quite difficult um, to perform right at four minutes. Dr. Pascali even said like, even if he was like immediate, immediately at the bedside, when the rest happened, with everything laid out for him, it would probably take him like four minutes in that instance. So for us, try to get it done like as soon as possible, get your help, get your stuff, um, and get your team ready to do this. So to end my talk today, I just wanna go through one last case. Um, so I want you to imagine yourselves working again, and you get a patch call that you have a 32-year-old female at 32 weeks gestation, and she's coming in with severe chest pain, work of breathing, her blood pressure is 80 on 60, and her heart rate's 120, and her vitals are getting worse and worse, and they're dwindling, dwindling, and she's looking a lot more unwell. Uh, and she's arriving in your eMERGE in three minutes. So VMS is gonna be here in three minutes. Uh, I'm gonna take you through three minutes to prepare for dramatics, of course. So I'm gonna take you through um, your ABCDs of a resuscitative hysterotomy. So to stress, CPR is going on before and after this procedure. A is your appropriate patient selection. So you're looking at patients who are 24 weeks gestation, so their um, uterine fundus is just above that umbilicus, and you don't have ROSC within four minutes. B is for your big, bold, bone-to-bone -bone incision. So you wanna make a large vertical incision from your xiphoid process to your pubic symphysis, so you need wide margins. If you have lateral retractors, you can use those as well. They're present in our C-section kits just to give you better visualization. 
Um, Dr. Pascali said that when he did this procedure once, um, if you use like our, our disposable scalpels in the eMERGE, um, they get quite blunt and he went through like six or seven, so you may need to use like multiple scalpels to get through all those layers. C is for cut through the uterus. So again, you're using your scalpel and you're making a vertical incision um, through the lower aspect of the uterus until you get uh, a gush of fluid. Um, then you're putting down your scalpel and you're extending that incision with scissors uh, caudally up to the uterine fundus. Um, to be able to visualize the uterus, you may need to retract the bladder downwards, um, or if it's very full, you may need to decompress that bladder um, just to get good visual visualization. Uh, D is for deliver the baby. So ideally, head first, mind the cord, um, cut the cord, deliver the placenta, pass off baby to your colleague for resuscitation. And S is for stop the bleeding. So you're going to pack the uterus after um, and have your OB colleagues um, uh, manage that essential laparotomy while you're continuing CPR and continuing your resuscitation. If you don't have OB av immediately available at your center, another good idea is you can also call your general surgery colleagues too. They're more than capable of dealing um, with a laparotomy, making the repairs and getting hemostasis. Things that I don't want you to waste time on would be things like prepping the skin. I may still mention that for my oral exams, but in reality for chlorhexidine to work, like it needs to dry, that's how it works. Um, so you're not gonna stand there for one to two minutes waiting for your chlorhexidine to dry. Um, this is a, uh, uh, an emergency procedure, so don't want you to waste time trying to get consent. Um, don't try to waste time assessing fetal viability by getting like a fetal heart rate or trying to ultrasound for that. Um, and if OB isn't immediately available at the bedside, um, start the procedure. Don't wait for RB for OB. Don't uh, wait to move to the OR if you can't get there uh, imminently. So that's kind of the procedure with 25 seconds to spare. Uh, this is just a quick visual. Um, diagram of how the procedure is performed from uh, Roberts and Hedges. Uh, so step one, you're making that large vertical incision, retracting laterally. You're retracting that uter the bladder downwards. You're making your vertical incision at the lower aspect, um, extending that cup up cut upwards, and then delivering the baby. So that's all I really have for you today. I can leave you with some quick take-home points that hopefully you can take with you um, the next time you may be encountered with any of these scenarios. So the first one is precipitous pre-hospital deliveries are associated with increased morbidity and mortality for both mom and fetus. Um, so know where your equipment is, um, prepare for two patients, um, and anticipate the complications like shoulder dystocia, cord emergencies, postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, in shoulder dystocias, the McRoberts maneuver via hyperflexion of the hips combined with super pubic pressure is my initial go-to maneuver. Um, it's the easiest to do, it's the least invasive, and it works pretty well. Um, and I would only consider an episiotomy um, if I'm doing any intravaginal like rotational maneuvers or delivery of the posterior shoulder just to create more space. Uh, nuchal cords are common. Um, they're not as scary as you think. The cords are usually loose and easily reducible. Um, in cord prolapse, you don't want to touch that cord at all. You want to manually lift the presenting part, place the mom in Trendelenburg uh, to let her stop pushing and get her up for emergent C-section. Managing postpartum hemorrhage includes uh, prevention, uh, being able to rapidly recognize this, um, and considering your four T's. And while the evidence is not great, um, I would still consider giving TXA in my sickest uh, postpartum bleeding patients. And then finally, resuscitative hysterotomies are performed after 24 weeks gestation for both maternal fetal resuscitation. So again, changing our mindset to like a maternal fetal resuscitative approach um, in parallel. So it improves maternal hemodynamics, improves uh, rates, of, rates of ROSC, and um, increases your chances of neonatal survival. That's all I have for you today, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions.